Good morning and welcome to our public worship service at St John's Presbyterian Church Annerley with our resident pastor Reverend Martin Duffield leading worship on this occasion. The Reformation Remembrance occasion is traditionally celebrated on the last Sunday in October, being the closest Lord's Day to the 31st of October when Dr Martin Luther took his stand. One of the principles established during the Reformation period was the authority of scripture alone to instruct the Lord's people as how they are to live before him. As question eight of the Shorter Catechism answers, the scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. In contrast to the availability of the Bible in our own country today, we note that in Britain in the 15th century, a law was passed that whosoever should read the scripture in the mother tongue, they should forfeit land, cattle, life and goods from their heirs forever. In the 16th century, a Bible was printed and fixed to a desk in all churches and the enthusiasm of folk to read or to hear it read was said to be remarkable. The open Bible before us today on this table was a very precious symbol to a previous generation even within this congregation. We ought not to regard our practice of displaying the open Bible as a relic of former days, but rather a vital visual representation of a particular state of blessedness and liberty granted to us. Again, as our church family, we commend those who are undergoing some difficulty. We commend you again, Mrs. Wendy Nielsen, uh, with her painful leg condition, there's been some progress as she's now on the uh, outpatient list of the PA hospital uh, to see a vascular surgeon, we hope, very soon. Again, we commend you, our man's family, for your prayerful concern. We also remember all our church family members in retirement complexes. We think of Mrs Florence Lister at Brooklyn's Retirement Village in Robinson and Mrs Merle Willis in the TRICARE complex here at Annerley. Of course, we always uh, commend to you those with long-term illness. We think of Michael Knuckler and we think of Mrs. Jean Miller. But just uh, following the service this morning, the session will briefly meet uh, in the vestry at approximately 11 a.m. Our evening worship is usual, 16 p.m. with, uh, at this time, our own pastor, Reverend Martin Duffield. The uh, activities for the coming week, our Thursday evening Bible study, as usual, via Zoom, 7 p.m., Next Saturday, the 5th of November, is our prayer meeting, 7.15am in the vestry, and it will be also next uh, Saturday our working bee, uh, approximately 9am, around the church and the grounds. Uh, it is hoped to undertake, I believe, next Saturday, uh, laying a slab under the church, and uh, so um, uh, that's to help with our storage area, so any who are able to assist in this or other activities next Saturday will be greatly appreciated. So please see Doug this morning uh, regarding that project under the church. Next Sunday, that's Sunday the 6th of November, our services um, at this stage as usual, morning worship led by Pastor John Tucker, evening worship by our own pastor, Reverend Martin Duffield. Uh, the, the latest edition of the Challenge newspaper will be made available today. Each family unit is encouraged to take a copy and those who'd like additional copies for personal outreach are most welcome to do so as well. We are now encouraged to engage in personal preparation just prior to the call to worship. Thank you. gathered to worship our God this morning and we shall do so with the call coming from the 34th chapter of the Psalms, the 34th Psalm, in verses 1 to 3. Let's hear his word to us this morning. 
The psalmist said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad, and magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. We're going to exalt his name with the introit this morning, which is all hail King Jesus twice through. Let's now meet with God in prayer and uh, we will adore him in our prayers this morning. Let's all pray. Our almighty and most holy God, for this day we gather here not just to worship you in spirit and in truth, but to cast our minds back to a period of great spiritual darkness out of which your glorious light began to shine. But for your wondrous intervention in what we now know as the Reformation, who knows what the church and the world would be like today. We praise you and we thank you for this wonderful providential intervention from which we still all benefit so much and in so many ways. We rejoice in and praise you for the grace that you gave your people at that time to pursue the truth and all its impl implications in godliness in spite of tremendous threats and hardship. Well, Father, as we contemplate your goodness in the Reformation today, we are filled with joy and the desire to praise you for the mercies of those days and all days since. Sometimes in the darkest moments of human existence, you bring help and you relieve the miseries of your people because you are a good and just God, one who cares for his church, his message and his people. Blessed be your name for so ministering to us and to those before us who loved you, loved your truth, and delighted in your presence and your power as we did this morning. So help us to worship you today in the manner worthy of all these things, especially in the face of the facets of your being and acts in history. Fill us this morning with your spirit. Teach us through your word afresh or anew of the wondrous things that are contained in your law, in the prophets, in the gospels and every portion of the Holy Scriptures. O oh Lord, we are your servants. Equip us even while we sing your praise and send us from worship into service and obedience with every spiritual blessing from the heavenlies. These things we ask for the sake of your praise and your glory in our Lord Jesus' blessed name. Amen. 
We're going to open, um, we're going to continue to sing to God's praise, a, an exhortation for revival, but it's also a, a hymn of praise to God, revive us again. Two readings this morning comes from the book of Ezra. Both readings have to do with the role of the word of God in the revival of his ancient church. Ezra chapter 10 verses 1 to 17. Verse 1. Now while Ezra was praying and while he was confessing, weeping and bowing down before the house of God, a very large assembly of men, women and children gathered to him from Israel, for the people wept very bitterly. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehal, one of the sons of Elam, spoke up and said to Ezra, We have trespassed against our God and have taken pagan wives from the peoples of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel in spite of this. Now therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the, these wives and those who have been born to them according to the advice of my master and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter is your responsibility. We also are with you. Be of good courage and do it. And Ezra arose and made the leaders of the priests, the Levites and all Israel swear an oath that they would do according to this word. So they swore an oath. Then Ezra rose up from before the house of God and went into the chamber of Jehoanan, the son of Eliashib. And when he came there, he ate no bread and drank no water, 
for he mourned because of the guilt of those from the captivity. And they issued a proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem to all the descendants of the captivity that they must gather at Jerusalem and whoever would not come within three days according to the instructions of the leaders and elders all his property would be confiscated and he himself would be separated from the assembly of those from the captivity. So all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered at Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month on the 20th of the month and all the people sat in the open square of the house of God trembling because of this matter and because of heavy rain. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have transgressed and have taken pagan wives, adding to the guilt of Israel. Now therefore, make confession to the Lord God of your fathers and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples of the land and from the pagan wives. Then all the assembly answered and said with a loud voice, Yes, as you have said, so we must do. But there are many people. It is the season for heavy rain, and we are not able to stand outside. Nor is this the work of one or two days, for there are many of us who have transgressed in this matter. Please let the leaders of our entire assembly stand, and let all those in our cities who have taken pagan wives come at appointed times together with the elders and judges of their cities until the fierce wrath of our God is turned away from us in this matter. Only Jonathan, the son of Hazael, and Jehaziah, the son of Tikvah, opposed this, and Mishalam and Shabbatai, the Levite, gave them support. Then the descendants of the captivity did so, and Ezra the priest, with certain heads of the father's households, was set apart by the father's households, each of them by name, and they sat down on the first day of the tenth month to examine the matter. By the first day of the first month, they finished, finished questioning all the men who had taken pagan wives. And to God be all the glory. Amen. A particular word of God, of course, that dealt on the broad that renewal and revival was, you shall not take for yourself the daughter of a foreign God, as you've heard. So we shall come to the other reading, which is, of course, from Jos Josiah's life in Second Kings. Well, let's take a moment to confess our own sins this morning. Let's all pray. Oh God, our Father in heaven, as we ponder the revival under Josiah, as we admire his piety and dedication to your glory and the good of his wayward people, we are reminded of our own times, which in many ways reflects the spiritual, cultural and social decline of this ancient society. So too are the reasons for our decline the same as his, the neglect of the word of God, first by your shepherds, in the pollution of worship and life, and then by your people who are ignorant of that word. Well, Father, our prosperous times, as they have been now for two whole generations, have brought much comfort and even luxury to a large portion of the people in the West, even your own people in the midst of them and as a result zeal for the gospel hunger for public worship and the Christian life in general these things have been quenched if not snuffed out in part by the trappings of personal wealth and worse these trappings have come from the wealth borrowed from our grandchildren the burden of the repayment of the interests of that they will bear, while our generations have indulged in substance and run up the massive debt. We ought to be utterly ashamed of our debt, driven by our selfish consumerism in so many ways. 
but instead we are among a people who complain and increasingly over our smallest inconveniences. Lord, the sins of our age could fill many words, but we here know the awful truth of these few. We recognise the consequences of this have started to arrive economically with rapid inflation, increasing interest rates, exploding debt levels and increasing debt slavery and trauma. However, long before these things have come upon us, they have damaged the faith of two generations, damaged the character of the people of our society and left behind a church which in many places is a shell of former days. O oh Lord, are we in any way caught up in any of these evils? Are our lives adorned with the ugly fruit of the neglect of spiritual things in the pursuit of the consumption of the material pleasures of the senses? If so, forgive us and restore us, we pray, that we might change the way we live and think. And if we won't repent, then chastise us even harsher until we clear the heart and the mind of every foolish idol, for such as all these things are to us. For we ask it in our Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing to the praise of God again. 4.45 and rejoice, O oh, for a heart to praise my God. again in the word of God this time to our portion for today from 2 Kings chapter 22. Yep. Thank you. So again, uh, 2 Kings chapter 22 verses 1 to 20.
verse 1. Josiah was 80 years old when he became king and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedah, the daughter of Adaiah of Bozkath. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Now it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan the scribe, the son of Azaliah, the son of Mishalem, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkah, the high priest, that he may count the money which has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have gathered from the people. And let them deliver it into the hand of those doing the work, who are the overseers in the house of the Lord. Let them give it to those who are in the house of the Lord doing the work, to repair the damages of the house, to carpenters and builders and masons, and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. However, there need be no accounting made with them of the money delivered into their hand, because they deal faithfully. Hilkah, the high priest, said to Shaphan the scribe, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. So Shaphan the scribe went to the king, bringing the king word, saying, Your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house, and have delivered it into the hand of those who do the work, who oversee the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkah the priest, Ahikam the son of Shaphan, Akbor the son of Micaiah, Shaphan the scribe, and Azariah, a servant of the king, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So Hilkah the priest, Ahiakim, Akbor, Shaphan, Azariah, went to Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikvah, the son of Haas, the keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter. And they spoke with her. Then she said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants, all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be aroused against this place and shall not be quenched. But as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord in this manner, you shall speak to him. Thus the Lord God of Israel, says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse, and you tore your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place. So they brought back word 
to the King. And again, to God be all the glory. Amen. Let's now come again to God and to thank him for the offerings that have been given this morning and through the week and also to seek his face about our college and about the work of Christian lobby groups. Let's all pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you for another week. We thank you for its pleasant and its unpleasant days, for they all are given to us for our good. We thank you especially for our past and the mercies in, in it which still flow to us today. Thank you for your faithfulness in not giving up on the church in so many ages, in so many different circumstances, but for always preserving a remnant of your faithful people, such as exists today in spite of these times of difficulty and declension. We do pray for the gifts that have been given, that you would use them to maintain the witness and the work of the remnant of your church, wherever that remnant is, how large or small it is, that these funds may go and maintain and extend the work of your kingdom wherever, um, wherever they go. May it please you also, Lord, to have mercy on our college at this time, uh, and that your hand may be upon the attempt to buy back the college building that we had previously purchased extraordinarily some 15 years ago. Would you pray that uh, if that doesn't occur, that you would be pleased to use the funds that have been given to enable us to purchase a property somewhere else. Give us more students, we pray, to be trained to serve the Church of Queensland and other non-ministry candidates who will go to be assisted in um, their ministries uh, of teaching uh, women or children or just generally Bible studies as elders and other people seek to grow in the knowledge of God through the ministries of the college. Bless Gary Miller, the principal, and all of the staff with sufficient health, strength and wisdom to be able to impart the precious knowledge of the gospel to the students, whether they be candidates for our ministry or not. We ask also this morning our, our God for the work of all of those organisations that exert a pressure and influence upon our politicians at all levels of government. We remember especially the, the Family Voice, the ministry in which uh, our own brother Peter Downey is involved, and we uh, continue to ask for wisdom and grace for him as he directs that work. We thank you for those who labour with him, uh, including Andrew McColl, and uh, we pray for um, the support of grace of Family Voice to grow, for its financial needs to be met, and for its role and influence in Australian politics and in the Christian community to also increase. That they would glorify God in standing for righteousness with grace and with courage in all that its people do, whether in the churches or in the media or in, with our politicians. We thank you too for Martin Isles and the Australian Christian Lobby we, we continue to seek your mercies for its financial and logistical needs and that Martin and, and others would be protected from those who would assault them in various ways uh, in the media um, and uh, uh, sometimes in the parliaments uh, with some of our politicians who are brutal in their assaults, verbal assaults upon uh, the Christian um, beliefs. We do pray for its influence in Australian politics to grow that whatever righteousness is to be found amongst our politicians and whatever political persuasion that that would be added to and encouraged and strengthened by the efforts of the Australian Christian Lobby and others. And like Family Voice, we pray that you would be glorified in the ability of these people to stand for righteousness wherever they are to be heard with grace and with courage. We ask this all in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray together as a family, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We're going to sing a, uh, a hymn, a psalm of praise concerning the word of God. Psalm from Psalm 119, your servant blessed by you shall live. Just ask God's blessing in prayer upon the word now this morning. Let's pray. Our Father, it is our privilege to be able to hear the word of God, to hear it preached, to be exposited clearly and simply, or at least this is what we pray, and to hear it clearly and simply preached every Lord's Day, twice, morning and evening. We thank you for that. We do pray this morning that we would have open ears, that you'd prepare our hearts through the Spirit and that the Word would come to us in power and mixed in us with faith. We ask it to the praise of your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are dealing with one of the most famous, precious portions of the Old Testament. It's a portion which is a very mixed in its subject because it contains what is really the revival of one man while his nation eventually would collapse around him. But it's an important one and it does give us some connection to the Reformation and what happened in the Reformation and some lessons for us today as should always be the case when when a sermon is truly delivered. So we're dealing with the precursors to the Reformation, things that led to Reformation, at least a couple of them this morning. As of a few weeks ago, we can now say, God save the King. We know he will reign in the most turbulent times. With present indications of a coming worldwide food shortages, potentially high if not hyperinflation, Domestic and international politics unrest come to pass or worsen. And therefore, he has inherited a difficult mantle. His mother, the Queen, reigned faithfully through three generations to the universal admiration of the world up until these difficult times. Though she had some of her own, of course, like World War II. Sorry, like the, uh, the wars of, uh, and the struggles of uh, post-World War II era. The years in which she served have seen her culture and her church corrupt and fearfully, especially in recent times. 
She remains steadfast in her profession of faith, her defence of the democratic societies of the Commonwealth, but all around her, even in her church, and the church widely, humanity has moved far away from the beliefs and principles that made the Commonwealth great. The price is now being paid for that, or at least it's beginning to be paid. <clears throat> so how will King Charles respond? What will be his attitude to God and to the word of God? What good influences will he bring upon the nation, especially from God's word as the defender of the faith as he is called? Time will tell, and we hope happily for us all. But King Charles III has many good biblical models. One is in our subject today, King Josiah, who reigned for 30 years from 641 to 611 BC. He came to power at an age far younger than Charles' two sons are now, and even far younger than the young queen, Elizabeth, in 1952 at 26 years of age. King Josiah took the throne at eight years of age in that year of 641 BC until he began to personally seek God at 16 years of age in um, uh, at 16 years of age at uh, 625 BC. He came to active prominence at the age of 26 as our reading from 2 Kings 22, 1 tells us. His reforms recorded in 2 Kings 22, 23 are famously and universally admired as a leader, ruler and reformer, but especially as a man. Today I want to spend some time looking at his amazing but ill-fated reformation in the southern kingdom of Judah. See some parallels between it and the great reformation of the church in the 16th century under Martin Luther and his fellow reformers and learn some lessons for ourselves. So it will be a practical examination of how it came to be and what it achieved, at least while the young king lived. So we are looking at the precursors to Reformation, which is the title, and the first one of these um, is, uh, is, the, is the pursuit of godliness in any way possible. By definition, Reformation implies a prior state of deformation or corruption and decay. If something does not need reforming, of course there will be none. It is already in a happy and fruitful state. But Josiah's nation and religion were not, at that point, in a good condition. The very physical condition of the Temple of Solomon was evidence of that, that it was actually dilapidated. We don't know what the so-called breaches in the Temple were, but they required stonemasons and carpenters as opposed to merely painters and tilers. And so we could say that it was not a job for the local committee of management. It required much greater skill. But that should make us stop and think, should it not? Doesn't that make you wonder how such a glorious temple of Solomon, a wonder of the ancient world, could have got into that appalling condition? Insurance assessors would say poor management or mismanagement or both. We are not told, but previous generations of rulers and priests we know were not faithful to God from the heart, and as a result they were obviously unconcerned about a decrepit state in terms of the house of prayer. Which decrepit state would impact upon God's glory before the watching world? It was a problem in and of itself, yes, but it was also a symptom of a much deeper problem of defamation or corruption in the priesthood that allowed it to fall into disrepair through neglect and irresponsible and in the end the acceptance of the unacceptable in terms, in this case, of the condition of the temple. The need for reformation is measured by the way things are supposed to be to God's glory as opposed to the things, the way things are, to our shame. We can get comfortable with neglect, with laziness, with growing blindness to our fault and its visible Im impacts. And here, a whole nation was like this. Whatever was true of the buildings was also therefore true of the souls of the priests, broken down, at least up until the reign of Josiah or just before. 
It is leaders who neglect their responsibilities that create the problems, which in this case showed in something like dry rot in the timber and big cracks in the stonework at the very least. What they were in those responsibilities as failures could reasonably be expected in other areas of their priestly life and labours. The very state of the nation spiritually and morally reflected that undoubtedly with thanks, sarcastically speaking, with thanks to his apostate father Ammon and his wicked, at least for a time, grandfather Manasseh. And this was so much so that even Josiah's stunning ref reformation, for all its zeal and effectiveness could not ultimately turn the tide away from the collapse of the nation. 23 years later, it was all destroyed by the swords and the war machines of Babylon. Well, Reformation's need was recognised by the young king. So he turned to the obvious and most public need of Reformation and Restoration, and that was repairing the temple. In the midst of such terrible apathy, neglect and irresponsibility, the young king himself, now, now a young man, still a young man, was moving to restore the temple to God's glory. And this was in his 26th year, but it was 10 years early, earlier as we read, that God started to stir him as a teenager, 16 years of age. And these stirrings were in the form of the need to reform his nation. In 2 Chronicles 34.3 we read, From the eighth year of his reign, that is when he was 16 years old, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images and the moulded images. Remember at 16, at, at 16 he is still 10 years from discovering the law. But even now at this point he knew enough about Israel, how Israel should worship and serve the Lord to start his purge of cultural evil. He is actively cleansing the nation of idols and the filthy moral corruption that always accompanies pagan religion. Curiously the purge of the nation spiritually may have affected it morally already as Josiah was able to hire men for the repair of the temple that was so honourable that they were trusted with the funds of restoration without the need for any documentation. These are high quality men. From this childhood he seems to have been guided in the path of goodness by godly mentors. And there is a big lesson for us here of course in terms of training children. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, as the saying goes. And whoever rocked Josiah's cradle must have both feared and loved the Lord. There must have been a purging of the staff of the king's court to achieve these sorts of results in this boy man. It is only a glimpse of the moral forms that would come under Josiah and his unnamed mentors, but they are impressive. True reform will only come through leaders and people of the highest moral and spiritual character. It is only these kinds of people that God can ever use. He can stir them to prayer. He can stir them to courageous and sacrificial actions because they trust him. They know him. The prelude to the wide revival of the church and nations is the revival, the personal reformation of a remnant, often a small remnant, uh, as we see here, but then God often works that way as we know. While we wait for revival and re reformation to come, we must therefore ensure that we are ourselves not in need of reformation, that we are not corrupt with the rest of the church, nation or culture. We live, as we have heard often, in times of serious moral and spiritual declension. And in the process we are being exposed um, to, the, to, to its evils. But we must respond by exposing ourselves instead to the most godly and the most faithful and the most reliable and the most trustworthy people around us. And trustworthy influence, including literature and other materials. 
We, in the end, are the product of the information and influences to which we expose ourselves. And in his book, The Benedict Option, author Rod Dreyer suggests a strategy for dealing with an overwhelmingly polluted and increasingly hostile social environment. And that was close-knit human communities. He was not arguing for complete isolation of such communities from the corrupting world, but rather severely limiting exposure to evil society and maximising exposure to good Christian society, starting in the home but also extending to the body of Christ. The ethical and theological purity of this close-knit Christian community, argued Dreyer, was to be preserved and protected against all outside corrupting influences. Israel had such dark generations under the two evil kings before him. Josiah was protected, preserved from it, exposed to godliness and truth while he waited for the ability, the maturity, which he found as a teenager to take on the corrupt nation without being overwhelmed and corrupted by it. He was ready when that time came. So the Reformation of Zion, the precursor of the Reformation of Josiah, when he was a lad of 16, came through his preparation, his personal preparation, being preserved from the evils of his father's corruption and being driven to personally seek God. So that by the time he was 16, he was already assaulting the kingdom of darkness, actively purging the nation of the moral and spiritual poison of paganism, even while his entire nation was asleep or dead and compromised with it. So let's look at the second critical phase as a precursor to the Reformation beyond personal godliness, which is a clear knowledge of God's will through God's word. So we're dealing with now remembering God's word. We began by speaking about pursuing God's holiness or pursuing holiness. We're now looking at remembering God's word. We are 10 years further into history. Josiah is now 26. He has been seeking the Lord for 10 years and labouring to obey him from what he was taught. Now he will hear God's very word as the scribe of 2 Kings 22 and 23 tells us as a result of the priests cleaning up the temple for renovation. And I quote from chapter 22 verse 8. Then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Hilkiah gave the book to Sharphan and he read it. Then Sharphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. Sharphan read it before the king. Now it happened, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, that he tore his clothes. So this is, of course, the decisive moment. It's the decisive moment. Would that it could have saved the nation, but alas, it didn't. However, for a short while, it would provide stunning testimony to the power of God through his word and through the life of a single godly ruler with the support of the godly around him. But first, what was the, what of the loss of the book of law in the first place? Well, it was symbolic and symptomatic of the whole sickness of ancient society. God said through the prophet Hosea, my people are destroyed through lack of knowledge. Or to put it more bluntly, God's people are destroyed through biblical ignorance. The nation had let, left its Bible up on the shelf gathering dust. It had ignored and was rejecting the word of God. It became so ignorant of God at one point that God taunted them, taunted the nation with this insult in Isaiah 1.3. He said, the ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel, my people, do not know me. So what's that saying? Dumb animals know who own them. But Israel wasn't even that smart, as smart as a dumb animal. God had spoken. He had revealed himself in so many ways, and yet a generation of rose that did not know God if it fell over him. As we say, ignorance of God's word guarantees ignorance of God. Without the revelation of God, 
people cannot know God, as you heard from the catechism questions this morning. They are dumber about God than animals are about their masters. If the priesthood didn't have the law, then the people had even less. Darkness is a metaphor for ignorance, and Israel at that time was in a period of great darkness, and so are we. They didn't know God nor his will for their lives. And yes, we remember the Reformation too. We remember the rediscovery, the same moment in history. The discovery of God's word to a people who not only did not have it, but in fact, as James read this morning, they could not have it. Here is a quote from a sermon that I preached in 2017 on the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. It's still online, I believe on the subject of the word of God and I wrote this did you know that before the reformers for about 300 years the undivided medieval church actually banned the common people from having the Bible from the decree of the council of Toulouse in 1229 we have this sanction from the church itself quote we prohibit also that the laity the ordinary people should be permitted to have the books of the Old or New Testament, but we most strictly forbid their having any translation of these books, that is, into their own languages. So I go on. For the next 300 years, the church itself kept the scriptures from the people in this way. Again, this time through the Council of Tarragona in 1234, a decade or so later, the church required that people possessing the Old and New Testament documents to hand them over to the local bishop to be burned within eight days. In 1415, 200 years later, the so-called proclamation at the Ecumenical Council of Constance confirmed this same ban on the ordinary people having the Bible, especially in their own languages. This is how determined the medieval church was to keep the Bible out of the hands of its lay people. So effective was this impact on the church until recent times, at least within the Roman Catholic Church, that one lecturer in the Department of Religion at the University of Queensland that I attended 30 odd years ago spoke of knowing Roman Catholic people who described the Bible as that Protestant book. That's the impact of that policy of hundreds of years before that Roman Catholics up until the 1950s saw the Bible as that Protestant book. Well, I can assure you the Roman Catholic Church has changed that policy, as we all know. The 16th century Reformation began with a few godly individuals who rediscovered the Word of God and its true teachings, some through the translation of the Scriptures Others, like Luther, through th studying it, lecturing and teaching it. And as people began to be exposed to the word of God, as it was rediscovered after being buried by the medieval church from the reach of the common people, and even the priests themselves sometimes, it was rediscovered and re restored, analogous to this very moment in Josiah's experience. Josiah's experience, of course, was simply a reflection or common to this people, experience of his own people who knew even less. True reformation depends heavily upon the word of God being known. It depends upon a church whose members are all well versed in scripture, not only knowing at least some of it by rote, but more importantly understanding it. Memorization should be accompanied with understanding and study as we are able. Scripture gives us reasons in terms of the following. If we know the word of God, we can resist false teaching, Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. If we know the word of God, we can discern good and evil better, Hebrews 5, 11 to 14. We can know God in Christ for eternal life through the scriptures according to John 20, verse 31. And to know the scriptures means we will be effectively equipped for ministry according to 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 16 for which the Bible was inspired by God. When Reformation comes, 
It must come guided by the truth of the word, just as in this case it was with the discovery to Josiah. By the knowledge of God, we not only see who God is, but we see how God sees us, and we shall consider that in a moment. Here is another quote from that sermon that I mentioned earlier. This time it's a quote from Martin Luther about the scriptures and the importance to him as a man and as a teacher. From the beginning of my personal reformation, I have asked God to send me neither dreams, nor visions, nor angels, but to give me the right understanding of his word, the Holy Scriptures. For as long as I have God's word, I know that I am walking in his way, and I shall not fall into any error or delusion. Martin Luther. God spoke through its ancient pages and the reformation of Josiah gained enormous impotence as the young king, still well shy of his 30th birthday, reacted to the awful truth that he had just heard. If I could leave my notes just for a minute. You know, there's a debate among the scholars over what he read or what was read to him. Some say it was the first five books which are sometimes called the law. Other scholars suggest that maybe it was the book of Deuteronomy. But a lot of scholars think it was just a section of Deuteronomy 28, chapter 28. Because that's the, te that's the chapter that would terrify anyone to read it. And if you don't believe me, go home and read it this afternoon. Chapter 28 of Deuteronomy. So, God spoke through its ancient pages. The Reformation of Josiah gained enormous impotence and we're going to look at the repentance and the Reformation briefly now as our final consideration of the passage. And it has to do, the other precursor with Reformation now is hum, being humbled over the realisation of sin, whether our sin or the sin of our church or our nation. So the Reformation of Jos Judah under Josiah was turned from a fire in Josiah's belly to a raging inferno in political life. He began with the famous tearing of his robe, which was an act of public grief and shock at what he had heard. He told the priest Hilkiah to go and ask of the prophet what God wanted. And he did it in this way. Go and inquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all Judea concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. The wrath of the Lord is great. When the news came back that God was not going to relent in carrying out the ultimate covenant curse in Deuteronomy 28 of invasion by the Babylonians and the exile of the people for 70 years away from the city. Nonetheless, what does Josiah do? He redoubles his efforts to reform the country. Just read 2 Kings 23 for the details of those reforms. Let me just mention a few from verses 19 and 20 of that chapter. Now Josiah also took away all the shrines of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger. He did them according to all the deeds he had done in Bethel. He executed he executed all the priests of the high places who were there on the altars. He executed them on the altars and he burned men's bones on them and then he returned to Jerusalem. True reformation, whether personal or church or nation, begins with a true and accurate assessment of the corruption that the word of God discovers and also a clear understanding of the associated threat from God that comes with it. We must have a true and clear sense of the offence that we have caused. We must understand well the distance from which we have fallen from the will of God, just as Josiah did at that moment. The word of God told him that the nation, what, what the nation should be doing, what it should look like, and he, all he could see was how that was not so with a brutal and terrifying clarity. His nation was so corrupt that it was on course for the fearful judgments about which those curses of the covenant warned in Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26 is the other passage. 
For Josiah, it was like looking out of the window of a beach house and seeing a tidal wave rising against the shore. At that moment, he understood how Habakkuk felt as Habakkuk actually saw the witness, sorry, witnessed the approach of Israel's slayer in the form of the Babylonian armies. Josiah realised what Saul felt when his nation was overrun at that moment by the Philistines. It was a moment of unimaginable terror. That's why he tore his robe. And that's why he redoubled his efforts to clean up the nation because perhaps, perhaps God might relent of his threat because remember he did with the Ninevites. Remember Jonah said, you're destroyed in 40 days. Didn't even offer repentance. And the Ninevites collapsed in fear. They even, they even put sackcloth and ashes on their animals in the hope that perhaps God might relent from his fury. That's why Joseph, jo Josiah did that, in the hope that perhaps God might relent. And therein lies our hope, does it not, to pursue reformation personally and publicly, even though we might think it's all over, as John MacArthur, the Baptist preacher in America, thinks it's all over for us as a civilization. To know God's word is surely to have a proper sense of the foreboding of the near future. What will be next for us if there is no change in the direction of our culture as Josiah saw? We may not tear our robes, but we should grieve at the state of the nation and fear for its short to medium term future. But like Josiah, we should never be without hope because our God is merciful. We should be like the men of Issachar, David's servants, who understood the times and knew what Israel do, should do. And how did they understand the times? Because they knew the law of God, especially Deuteronomy 28. They knew what pleased God and what didn't please him. They knew what he did to rebellious generations of nations past. And they could easily anticipate, based on what they saw, God threatened in the future. They were like Winston Churchill, who said somewhere, the longer you look, the longer you look back, the further you can look forward. Or could we say as Christians, paraphrasing that, the deeper you look into the past through scripture, the better you understand the present, and the more accurately you can anticipate the future. Josiah could see what was coming. He tore his robes in horror. He saw the tidal wave of God's judgment coming upon the beach house of a wicked nation, and he fell helpless in the realization of the inevitable, and understandably, he tore his robes. But still, but still, he redoubled his efforts to reform himself and his people. As Abraham saw the doomed cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and prayed, as Nineveh heard Jonah's threat and humble themselves, so we can respond with humility and honesty and change personally and corporately wherever we need. What of us today? Will God ever send reformation? Or will he send judgment upon an unreformable culture? We can reform and keep reforming ourselves. We can ourselves resist the tide, even if the tide does not stop, and go on in opposite, the opposite direction, even though the resistance is strong and unpleasant or even violent. Remember, the gospel is a message of hope with incredible power. It is about deliverance from personal, personal danger from the consequences of our sin against God. Christ's death is a stark warning that unrepentant sin will eventually and certainly find terrible punishment, whether individual, church or nation. But the cross also extends, does it not? Forgiveness to those who will see their sin as described in God's word and who will humble themselves completely and personally and strive to make the change. The call to be reconciled to God has saved people in their own sin we know in previous centuries it has saved churches in their sin and even whole denominations. And yes, we know that at times even whole nations have been changed as a result, ancient and modern. The question is, will we look at ourselves in the mirror of God's truth and honestly confess with, <coughs> where necessary? Will we reform our lives 
even if the church and the nation will not, in our pursuit of holiness. The King of England, Charles III, would do well to rediscover the God of his mother if he hasn't already. We can but pray that he does, as the defender of the faith in the Commonwealth. We can but pray that he will understand himself, his nation and his world through that book that may well lie, lie hidden in his library, I do not know. Whatever the king does, if reformation does not come to our country or our commonwealth, even if the church continues to weaken and compromise or apostatize, we must not and cannot follow. Sanctification is about the reformation of our lives personally, corporately and continually. It is about looking into scripture and seeing how we really are and looking at what God really respects of us, expects of us. Even in dark and difficult times, God can be glorified and as Josiah proved, like his great descendant Jesus, Godliness shines even more brightly when the darkness deepens around. Let's pray. Well, Lord our God, we thank you again for the timeless truths of Scripture. The days of Josiah never leave. As long as your people go through the cycles of faithfulness to unfaithfulness and back to faithfulness, these times will come. There are winters in the life of the churches. There are winters in the lives of nations. And we know that we are certainly in the midst of that in various ways in our society and our church. But we thank you again for reminding us this morning of your power to change and transform. And we thank you for the message and for the Holy Spirit that, is enabled, that enables us to do that. The church to do that and even nations to do that. And we pray these things with hope this morning, even as we're sent from this place with the urgent exhortation to watch our life and doctrine, to pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Amen. So we shall um, sing a, a, a hymn which is a prayer for reformation and revival in our hearts. It's a beautiful hymn, uh, O Breath of Life.
Our benediction comes from uh, 2 Thessalonians 3.16 and after that we shall sing the dox so doxology now to the King of Heaven. Let's come to the benediction. And now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always and in every way the Lord be with you all. Thank you.